Yeah, I'm going to ask uh, our speakers, uh, uh, Tom Gilson and Tim McGrew, to come, come up to the platform and uh, introduce them to you. Uh, Tom is uh, limp along, hop along, and uh, Tom has worn a lot of hats in apologetics over the year. So, uh, you were with Crew before Crew was Crew, back when they were Campus Crusade for Christ. That's right. right? And uh, and you you've done did you did something else on a, with radio or uh, Touchstone or? Well, I was with uh, uh, Charles Colson's yeah. ministry for a, a while, a couple of years, working on uh, with with them in strategies, and then with Rashio Christie right. for a couple of years after that. What are you doing now? <clears throat> Mostly, I'm working with the with an online. Uh, Christian Daily called The Stream, stream.org, where I'm a senior editor, do a lot of writing, and um, also on the side I'm developing some work, uh, along with Tim and some others, in Christian strat apologetics strategy for getting uh, more effectively connected with churches. Great, great. And Tim McGrew teaches uh, philosophy. You are full professor and department chair at... Uh, for my Western. sins, yes. Yes, uh, at Western Michigan University, and Tim has a PhD in philosophy from Vanderbilt, and uh, Tim is just one of the smartest guys I know, and, uh, and uh, he is well read in any number of areas, and I know some smart people, you know, some, some people, some people if they say, you're one of the smartest people they know. It just shows they don't get out much. <laughs> but uh, uh, Tim is a, is a real treasure. There, there is a Facebook group called McGroupies. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm one of Tim's groupies. So, uh, so uh, grateful to have Tim and Tom here. Tom, tell me about this book. Yeah, this uh, just uh, released this book, the, A Christian Mind. A, uh, thoughts, it's Thoughts on Life and Truth in Who Jesus Christ, and I wrote it. Okay. Yeah, it is a compilation of some of the best from 10 years of blogging at my blog called Thinking Christian, thinkingchristian.net, plus a couple of other articles you won't find there, and uh, just put it out through Amazon, and it's available here for sale in the cafeteria, and Bob's got one here. And I'm going to give it away. Enjoy it. Get him to sign it, but not right now. Not right now. Not right now. So uh, take it away. Uh, you've seen how we roll. Uh, they they will talk to each other and to you uh, for a while, and then we'll have Q and A. And uh, at eleven fifteen, we will we will break for lunch. Bob didn't mention that Tim is a uh, national master chess player and. I've known Tim a while, but this morning was the first time we ever sat down at a computer and he was showing me chess problems. And I, I, I tell you, I was still looking for the king and he had it solved. This guy, is, he's, he's a, but a great friend. We, we're, it's a treat to be here at this forum. It's a treat to be here with my friend Tim. And what we want to do here today, this morning, is talk about developing skills in a new form of apologetic. A form that's rarely discussed, rarely discussed among apologists, but it's taking on supreme urgency in our day. It's a moral apologetic. And what, I'm, what, what I mean is not the moral argument for God, but an argument, a case for the moral goodness of Christianity. Because, because the world has taken an unexpected turn. We are in unfamiliar territory here in the West, and especially in America. No one could have predicted this, really. In fact, when I was in college, people, uh, I remember having conversations about the persecution of Christians in the Soviet Union, and the question came up, could Christians ever be persecuted in our country? I was in college a long time ago. And 
The, uh, the answer we came up with is yes, theoretically possible, but I can't imagine it happening. Well, now we can imagine it happening. And in fact, Christianity as a moral guide, which was once the moral guide for all of Western culture, has now by many become despised. We need to develop a moral case for Christianity because it has, our culture has turned so far as to say that Christianity is bad, it's evil. And, I mean, let me just go down a, a quick list and see if any of this sounds familiar. You're a hater. You're homophobic. You're intolerant. You're against equality. You think faith is better than reason. You're anti-science. You're anti-intellectual. You're arrogant. You think your morality is better than other people's. Does any of this sound familiar? This is new in our culture. You're trying to impose your religious beliefs on us. You're butting into people's lives. You're judgmental. Uh, you're responsible. Religion's responsible for most of the wars in history. And by the way, it's anti-woman and pro-slavery. As a scientist, I'm increasingly worried about how faith is undermining science. It's something we must resist, because irrational faith is feeding murderous intolerance throughout the world. In a progressively more secularized world, it sometimes seems that the only religious people out there are fanatics. And frankly, I'm fed up with them. You look into any over-the-top, cruel, and wanton atrocity in the world today, and chances are you'll find some scripture-spouting nutbar judging and condemning and punishing and happily killing the innocent while cloaked in the garb of faith. The very definition of arrogance is someone who presumes to know God's will and to speak in her name. I would never be a Christian because they're so fake and so judgmental. I know people that are just kind of all talk and they don't really live it. They always think that they're the only ones that are right and they're the only ones that know everything. This is the new condition in which we're practicing, in, in which we're doing evangelism, in which we're practicing apologetics. It's got to influence our apologetic now. It's got to influence our apologetic. This is actually not an entirely new point, and we'll be stressing that. That's kind of why we framed it this way. How many of you have heard of Blaise Pascal, the great French polymath, Pascal? There's a quotation from Pascal's thoughts, his pensées, that I think is very appropriate for us, and we need to let it sink in and think about it. Here's what he says. See if this reminds you of the present time. Men, he writes, despise religion. They hate it and are afraid it might be true. To cure that, we have to begin by showing that religion is not contrary to reason, that it is worthy of veneration and should be given respect. Next, it should be made lovable. Make good men wish it were true. Then, show them that it is. And the, uh, the the order there is crucial in our day. Make good people, or whoever, wish it were true, and then show them that it is. Because who's going to care if it's true when it sounds so bad? You want me to join that club? We've got to get to the point where we help people understand that joining the fellowship, entering into the faith, is actually still good. But, but are we ready for this? This is the question, and, and I've, I've been trying to make this, to, 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 to promote this point for a while, and I'm still asking, are we ready for this? But we have got to be ready for it. It's not just a matter of how we communicate, though it is that. Look, I teach on a secular college campus. I understand running into prejudices about Christianity, about religion in general, about any claim to having the truth. But it's going beyond that now because even in the activities that we think of as more paradigmatically apologetic activities, like debating the existence of God or even debating morality and its foundations, 
our adversaries are changing tactics. I want to illustrate this with reference to two prominent debates between high-profile atheists and Christians who are superbly well-qualified to speak to the intellectual side of this. The first one I want to talk about is a debate between Sam Harris and William Lane Craig that took place at the University of Notre Dame in 2011. How many of you have heard of or maybe even seen on YouTube some of that debate? A few people scattered. Let me encourage you, go and watch the debate, or as much of it as you can stomach. And if you can't stomach a lot of it, then I'm going to tell you, go to this particular part. I'll frame it for you. Bill Craig laid out two knockdown arguments against the kind of atheism specifically that Sam Harris espouses as providing any room for moral value at all. On a philosophical level, Bill had him outgunned six ways from zero. Go to the point in the debate, if you don't have a lot of time, just go to the point where Harris is given a chance to respond, and here's what happens. He does not even try to address the arguments. He doesn't even try. He doesn't break down the premises and say, but this one I disagree with because of this. None of that. For 10 minutes, he goes on a rant about how wicked Christianity is, about how evil it is, about how morally reprehensible it is, and that's all he does. There's not a single point of engagement with Bill Craig's argument. If you were scoring this debate as a scorecard, saying, well, okay, who, who hits these points, who drops which points? Craig, Craig would have won anyway, but he would have won this one 100 to nothing. But if you were sitting in the audience watching people, watching people nod, watching people cheer, watching people get angry, the score would look very different. Harris walked in there not even intending to address the arguments. What he wanted was a platform for preaching, and what he wanted to preach was how awful Christians are and how awful Christianity is. And he did that for 10 minutes very effectively. Second debate. Can I just yeah, make go. a point, too? Sam Harris at that time was the head of a group called Project Reason, mm -hmm. and he didn't engage the arguments on the level of reason at all because he had another strategy. Right. Second example, just to show that's not a one-off. This past fall, I was at Southern Evangelical Seminary for their apologetics conference. Great conference, wonderful people there, just an amazing time. In fact, it reminded me in some ways of this conference, except there are some respects in which I like this one better because I get to eat lunch with you guys. This is good. But they had a debate there between Richard Howe, who is philosophically not, I mean, we, we can't even compare him to Dan Barker, the atheist they brought in, and Richard gave rational, coherent arguments, and Barker went on one long rant. I actually went back into the green room, the speaker's room. I was searching for snacks, true confession, and uh, back there on the table in the speaker's room, I found that Barker had left a sheet of his debate prep just one page. So I picked it up. I was like, okay, well, that's kind of cool. What, what's he, what's he going to do? And just on that one page, there were sound bites, not arguments, not analyses, no engagement with argument at all, just sound bites. Your God has breathtaking anger management issues. How, how do you respond in a debate to that? It was a deliberate, strategic choice. This was not something that Barker stumbled into because he couldn't think of something else to say. It's true that if he had tried to engage with Dr. Howe in terms of the arguments, he would have been soundly defeated. He just chose to change the game altogether. He's not going to play by any of those rules. He's there for a different purpose, and that purpose is to pick up on what is becoming a very common cultural trope that Christianity is just wrong. It's on the wrong side of history. It is anti-gay, anti-transgender, and yet homophobic. You name it, Christians are out there. They won't bake the damn cake, to 
paraphrase a governor of a state that is near mine. Uh, so what we want to do this morning is to persuade you as apologists to take note of the moral complaint against Christianity. I hesitate even to call it an argument because, honestly, it's generally not an argument. It's generally presented as if everybody knows these things are true. We're just too embarrassed to come out and state them overtly, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell you about all the BS in the Bible about slaves and women and this and that, and then when I'm done with that, you're going to say, wow, yeah, why does anybody listen to that? That is the new strategy. And we need to recognize that this is going to be preceding arguments. It is going to be coming first. Whether it's verbalized that way or not, this is now the elephant in the room. Now, you may wonder, is this apologetics? Is, you know, is it just a matter of doing better, for example? showing that we're good. Well, and, and is there any place to turn to for guidance on this? Because this is a new problem in Western culture. Uh, you know, we haven't faced this in anybody's living, living memory. We haven't faced it in even literary memory. Or so I thought. And then, I don't remember why, but I picked up a book that Prove to me that it wasn't. This is an area where, where Tim is actually a lot more uh, qualified than I am, so he'll spend most of the time on it. Uh, but the, the, what I discovered is that this isn't such a new, it, this isn't such a new problem after all. And, and I started doing some reading and I actually felt amazingly at home there in a place that you wouldn't expect. And it has to do with going back a long ways to another time when Christianity had a lot of moral arguments or complaints raised against it. It was surprisingly fun to discover. So, so, so Tom's talking about the second and third centuries, and this is a that time— That long ago. It was still fun. Go for it. Fun I'll, I'll in a manner of speaking. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Be careful what you pray for. I'm not sure that kind of fun is the kind of fun I want. <laughs> But, you know, giving dental exams to lions used to be part of a normal Christian job. So, <laughs> there's a book that's out so recent that I think you can't yet buy this in the United States. It's only been released across the pond, am I right? Well, you can buy it from Amazon UK. Amazon.uk. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, it's by Michael Kruger. It's called Christianity at the Crossroads, 2017. And in the preface, page 8 of the preface, he says something that's very germane about the relevance of these apologists to our contemporary milieu. Here's what he writes, just a, I think a very insightful paragraph. Christianity in the modern Western world has lost considerable cultural influence over the last generation and is now facing ever-increasing social and legal pressures. The modern church is being seen, seen, more and more as a threat to the social stability of modern society, similar to the way the second century church was viewed by the Roman elites. And at least in this way, there is much that the modern church can learn from our second century counterparts, if nothing else. We need to learn again what it means to be the church when we lack social or political standing. And that is something that sadly has been largely forgotten. Now, if you dip only casually into the literature of the earliest apologists, and if you're expecting, say, an early version of the cosmological argument, you will be surprised. That's not mainly what they're doing. If you're looking for a robust defense of the claim that Jesus Christ worked miracles, you will find very little of that. Why? What is apologetics? What's an apology? What does the word itself mean? An apology is a defense. And you defend yourself against what is being charged. You don't defend yourself against something else. You defend against the accusations that are being made right there against you. So what were the accusations being made against this generation of Christians. Tacitus, the Roman historian, 
writing around 110, 111, says that the Christians were followers of a depraved superstition, which spread starting from Judea all the way outward to Rome, that cesspool where everything that's wretched collects, a wretched hive of scum and villainy, he would have said if he had had the phrase at his command. Um, and that is something that Richard Dawkins has milked for all it's worth. This is superstitious. You want to get beyond superstition, don't you? Religion is superstitious. That's maybe the most recognizable part of the charge that they faced. We face this now in people who say, well, you just take things on blind faith, as though blind faith were just redundant, right? Once we said blind, we could have left the word faith off. But there are other charges. One of the charges that is most interesting is poor citizenship. Christians are poor citizens. Christians don't participate actively in the civic life of Roman society. Why not? Well, much of the civic life of Roman society was bound up in rituals to honor the gods and to support the worship of the previous Roman emperor as a god. The cult of emperor worship was very well entrenched in Rome and was promoted as a sort of thread to run through the various societies around the rim of the Mediterranean to unite them. Christians who didn't participate in those things were seen as civically inactive. They were lazy and they were impious because they didn't worship the gods. Now you think that's, a, that's not a charge that people would level against us today. Christians are too active in the life of communities for some secularists that they, they wish we would pull back. But stop a while and think, functionally speaking, what plays the role in our society of the kinds of things that the Christians wouldn't do in their society? Baking a cake? Providing a floral arrangement for a celebration? You won't do the things that you're supposed to do to be a normal functioning member of society. So really, even though the specific issues have changed somewhat, Functionally speaking, the challenge is very similar. Human nature doesn't change all that much. And so if you read these older works with both eyes open, you'll see these things coming up and you'll say, wow, okay, we're facing our own version of that today. Another challenge, atheism. Why, why would they be challenged with atheism? Because they're not giving homage to the gods that everyone else is giving homage to. Which ones would those be? Well, they varied across the empire. Rome was very tolerant of your deities as long as your deities were tolerant of other people's deities. If religion, your religion, were just something you were content to do by yourself at home on Sundays, like knitting, they would have little problem with you. But if you're not, then you're challenging, in effect, our contemporary gods. It's a form of atheism, though without the name. And when you challenge the contemporary gods, the votaries of those gods are not going to be slow to condemn you. They will come after you. And they will come after you with some of the strangest accusations, things that you would say that these are so crazy on their face. How could anybody believe these things? You know what? That was taking place back in the second century as well. Here are some of the most common claims made about Christians from the second century. Christians are cannibals. Think about that for a minute. Where do you think that one might have come from? Awkward things Jesus said, okay? <laughs> Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Even his immediate disciples said, this is a hard saying. And many, were told in John, turned away at that point and would follow him no longer. Christians are cannibals. Okay. Uh, wow, once they've gone there, where else is there to go? Easy. Christians commit incest. What? Where did that one come from? Well, don't you know they call one another brother and sister? And they have these meetings where they get together in private. So... 
Right. How crazy is that? People believed it. People believed it widely. How could anybody believe that about these people? They did. Christians practice... Guess. What am I going to say next? How could, how could it get any better than that? I do have one that's better, though. Wild guess. I mean, what, you know, after cannibalism and incest, where do we go from there? Child sacrifice. Okay. I, I mean, we're like, we can't even think of a twisted scripture text for that one. But the blood libel went around that the Christians would get together and take an infant and cover the infant in flour so that you couldn't tell what it was, and then take turns beating on it until the child was dead, and then tear it apart and devour it. Gross image, complete slander. Origin has a comment about this, showing that the Christians' views were so distorted, their actual practices so misunderstood that they were rejected out of hand. Here's what Origen says in his work against Celsus around the year 250. These slanders, however, absurd, were of old, believed by many who differ from us, and even now some are so deceived by them and for this reason so averse to all Christians that they will have no discourse or communication with any of them. They won't even talk to us. I can jump in here. Yeah. This sounds foreign, you know, child sacrifice, incest, cannibalism. Those aren't charges against us. Uh, but we still, we are in a parallel situation in the sense that there are unbelievable charges being raised against us. I have met Baron L. Stutzman, who, uh, who owns one of the uh, florist shops that was under, and is under legal attack. Mm -hmm. and, and so often the attack is, you won't serve gays. The truth is that the, the, that the couple for whom she would not provide flowers for a wedding were friends and longtime customers. She served gays. She just wouldn't serve a certain uh, celebration. But it is, you are discriminating on, they're, they're, they're distorting the basis on which the discrimination happens. And um, my friend George Yancey, who is a uh, sociologist at the University of North Texas, has, has released a couple of works, one academic and one um, popular. The popular one is called So Many Lions, if I remember correctly, in, in which he documents the kind of extreme hate and anger provide, uh, or, or, or experienced by people who are especially in the cultural elite against Christians for us, and it's, and, and it's charges that are unbelievable. Like, we are really trying to turn America into a theocracy, and really trying to force everyone to believe what we believe, and really trying to do all kinds of wrong things. So, um, old unbelievable practices are unfamiliar to us, so we are more shocked by them, or, or old unbelievable charges, but there are unbelievable charges that we still have to face today that people do believe. They're unbelievable to us, but they are believed by many. I wonder often if people could talk to some of the people that I speak with, if it would change their minds. Probably the difficulty is just getting them to speak with those people at all. I remember the only time that I heard any Christian talk about somebody who was a drag queen was somebody who ran a mission out in Los Angeles. And she said, yeah, we, we had a, an aging drag queen come, come into the mission when he was dying of AIDS, and we took really good care of him. And that was it. We took really good care of him. Did they share the gospel? I hope so. I suspect that they did. But that wasn't the fundamental thing. The fundamental thing is, here's someone made in the image of God who needs care. And he can't get it anywhere else. And we'll take really good care of him. I don't know anybody who actually hates gays. Well, maybe I do. They are very few, but the whole church is lice under that charge. Right. All it takes is one or two vivid examples, some greasy, unctuous televangelist with his face screwed up, screaming in rage. Boom. That's the picture. That's the poster boy for Christianity now. 
And there are people who are actively looking for exactly those kinds of examples so that they can promote the narrative, promote the stereotype. So how did the apologists respond to these things? Here's a quotation from Justin Martyr's first apology, written around the year 150. He's talking to people about what Christians really are like. At the risk of sounding funny, I just want to point out to you that this is the argument he had to make. This is not a defense of either of the main premises of the Kalam argument. This is where the challenge was, so this is what he says. We, who once delighted in fornication, now embrace chastity only. We, who above all others loved the gain of money and possessions, now bring all that we have into one common stock and give a part to everyone that needs. We, who hated and killed one another, and because of their different customs refused to allow those of another nation to live with us under the same roof. Now, since the appearing of Christ, we live at the same table and pray for our enemies and endeavor to persuade those who unjustly hate us to live after the excellent institutions of Christ that they may have good hope with us to obtain the same blessings with God, the Lord of all. Thursday night, if I'm not mistaken, Christopher Brooks is going to be speaking here, right? Yeah. Yep. Hope some of you are around for that. Thursday evening, cross-cultural communication. What is it like to share the gospel? I know uh, a couple of guys, Adam Coleman, does a podcast largely aimed at the African-American community. He tells me, we can't get to square one until we clear away the idea that Christians are actually largely and often deliberately responsible for fomenting racial hatred and division. We can't get to square one. Adam's African-American himself. He knows better, but he said it's an amazingly difficult job to try to reach across those lines. And yet, here we are. What would we not wish to say that Tertullian or Justin Martyr or Irenaeus or Athenagoras might have said. Justin in this passage is telling us what the Christians were really like. Something to live up to, right? If the New Testament models aren't enough for you, take note of the fact that a hundred years after the bulk of the New Testament was written, Justin Martyr is saying, this is what we actually do, this is what we're actually like. When I grow up, I want to be like that. And the whole idea of, of enemies, people who had formerly been enemies, now we, we live at the same table. I think we've got a ways to go in things like racial reconciliation. But on the other hand, I can attest to, I have had sweet fellowship with Christians in communist Cuba, in Soviet Russia when it was still Soviet Russia, in red China, communist China, I have had communion served to me by a Vietnamese person, and this was years ago when the Vietnam War was still fresh in memory. And you know what? The reality is that when we connect, we connect really amazingly well. There are very few barriers. This is the beauty of the gospel. We do have something good to share. Let me just give you a couple more quotations to whet your appetite. And uh, by the way, if you're liking these quotations, if you say, hey, I would be willing to dip a toe, how many of you would be willing to take, oh, 10 or 15 minutes and read some stuff from old guys? Okay. The Older than us? Yeah, I yeah. think that's what I meant. Okay. Yeah. The rest of you, I will pray <laughs> for you. But uh, if you go to the website, Project 360, spelled out as words, T-H-R-E-E-S-I-X-T-Y, project360.org, there's a book by Thomas Brown, Testimonies of Heathen and Christian Writers of the First Two Centuries to the Truth and Power of the Gospel. Download it. It's a PDF. It's a short read, and it's pretty well organized, and you will find some of these quotations and many others, as well as accounts of the sufferings of the Christians, as well as numerous direct quotations from heathen authors making the kinds of accusations that we're talking about here 
It's all in one place, project360.org. This is a new uh, enterprise that Tom and I are involved in, and Mia Langford is our partner in crime over here. And there are a lot of resources through there, through the Library of Historical Apologetics, historicalapologetics.org. Just go, browse, kick it around, have a look. Here's one from Tertullian's Apology. This is what the Christians are like. To our God, we Christians look up with hands extended because they are innocent, with head uncovered because we have nothing of which we are ashamed, and pray without a prompter because we pray from the heart. We all pray without ceasing for all emperors, beseeching for them a long life, a secure reign, that their families may be preserved in safety, their armies brave, the Senate faithful, the people honest, the whole world peaceful, and whatever other things either the people or the emperor can desire. These are our desires. We are not here to turn the world upside down with civil war. People had tried that. Two generations before Tertullian is writing this, people had tried that in the Bar Kokhba rebellion, in which the Jews a second time rose up and Hadrian had to come in and absolutely crush that rebellion. Christians aren't trying to do that. We hope for peace and a long reign and safety and wisdom. And yet, the Christians are treated as public enemies. Why? Because they refuse to ascribe vain and lying and unauthorized honors to the emperors, like the previous emperor has now been deified and is a god, because in the spirit of true religion, their services are seated in the heart rather than displayed in wanton excess. Look up sometime the religious rituals of pagan Rome in the second century, and you'll have a very vivid impression of what Tertullian is talking about here. And the exercise of goodwill is not required of us with respect to emperors alone. We are bound to do good without respect of persons we are alike forbidden to wish or to do or to say or to think any evil of anyone. All of this and more like this, he has in his apology and then after going on like that for some time, he says, I shall now set forth the facts relating to the Christian faith that having refuted the slanders against it, I might display its goodness by a representation of the truth. Okay, now we're going to get apologetics the way that we all recognize it. But what has to be prefaced to that is a defense, an apology in the literal sense, of the goodness of Christianity. Um, again, there are various kinds of badness. There are the kinds of moral badness that we see when people just do evil things, but there is also a kind of use of your mind that is bad when you deliberately try to avoid the truth, try to avoid finding the truth. So, here's a quotation from Eusebius. How many of you have heard at least of Eusebius of Caesarea? Good guy, one of the good guys, okay? Writing about 310, he's got a work called A Demonstration of the Gospel. This is not his church history. It's a different book, but well worth recovering. He goes through a quick sketch, which he's then going to elaborate, of the argument pro from prophecy, and then he says, by this argument, we may show both the divinity and the certainty of the truth we possess, stopping the mouths of the patrons of falsehood by a rational proof. That is the thing these slanders contend we cannot supply, maintaining every day in their disputes with us with the utmost strength, and insisting upon this accusation that we are able to establish nothing by proof, but require those who come to us to depend on faith alone. How many of you have ever heard somebody say, you just take that on faith, you just believe that blindly, you just have… Right, very common accusation. There's a moral component to that accusation. You do something that you know isn't designed to get you to the truth. And Eusebius says that challenge is being thrown in our faces right here, early fourth century. And they're wrong. But you know, he says something else that's interesting. He says, I know where they're getting this. Here's where they're getting this. We don't require you to become a philosopher before you can become a Christian. We don't demand that. 
that would be unreasonable. Nobody can demand that. Most people can't become philosophers. And so we say, yes, we have our philosophers among us. We have people who have studied these things. But even for those who don't, the grace of God has opened the door. You can come to God without working through all of the arguments and the counter-arguments and the counter-counter-arguments and all of the 14 Greer Heard Forum presentations on both sides. Not saying you shouldn't buy the DVDs, but you can be a Christian without that. That was the ground of that, that since simple people could come to saving faith, it must be the case that faith is opposed to intellect. Not true, but it was a charge he had to answer. So then how can we emulate the second, third century apologists and develop a moral case for Christianity? There's a sense in which I don't want to answer that question because it's, I would be happier if you left this room bothered by the problem than somewhat satisfied by any kind of solution. Because we have got to develop an answer, and that's us, all of us, and the rest of the Christian community. We have got to develop an answer. But when that answer is developed, if we do emulate the second and third uh, century apologists, it'll have two parts to it. One is doing good. Christians have got to do good. Um, we, and, and generally speaking, while there is plenty of room for improvement, we do pretty well. But we have got to be very much growing and pushing the boundaries on self-sacrificial love. We've got to be taking leadership in the kinds of things that, that, um, that show goodness, things like caring for the homeless. Um, we are taking leadership in things like um, sex tra trafficking. We are taking leadership in things like care for the unborn, obviously. We could be taking more leadership in things like racial reconciliation. <clears throat> we have got to do good, but then we also have to explain that what we're doing is good. We've got to show that if we're making a case for marriage, it isn't just that the Bible says so, it's the Bible says so, and by the way, the Bible has it right because it's better. We have got to explain why it's good. And we can. You can make a case for traditional marriage without using the Bible. And we have got to have the ability to do that, not just because people don't listen to the Bible, but we, we've got to get past the point of people saying, yeah, it's in the Bible, therefore I don't like the Bible. We've got to explain why you can believe what the Bible says and still like the Bible. We've got to get to that point. Boy, especially with youth. Especially with youth who we, we are telling, believe the Bible, and they're saying, okay, why should I believe the Bible when I don't like it? But we can tell them that it's good if we can take the time to explain that what we uh, teach, what we present as moral, that it's not just a set of rules, but it's very, very good. And then, boy, we've got, to, we've got to be aware. We've got to listen well. In conversation, we've got to realize what people are really saying. We might even have to probe and say, what is it that's really your problem? Tim's got a story about that. Where, yeah. Yeah, so uh, a Christian and two Buddhists walk into a bar. Really, honestly, I was the Christian, and I was there speaking at what is known as the Bible and Beer Consortium in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. How many of you have heard of the BBC? This is an awesome acronym. Ezra, terrific, yeah. Ezra Boggs runs this yeah. uh, thing, and I, it's just fab fabulous because they actually get both Christians and skeptics to come together, and, uh, and we have fun in a bar. First, uh, the second time I spoke at one of those, I was doing a debate, and it was a kind of a big venue. I, this, the, I, I, Texas has everything bigger. I didn't realize this. <laughs> but there were probably enough seats for twice as many people as are here today at this bar, and they filled them. And I remember standing in front of the folding chairs. They didn't have nice pews. Uh, standing in front of the folding chairs and looking around half an hour before the debate, 
came and, and this guy walks up to me with a blue armband. He looks at me and he offers me a blue armband. I'm like looking at him. It was blue armband required for debating about miracles. Is that what it is? <laughs> and he goes, are you going to get anything at the bar? And I, suddenly the light went out and I just smiled and I pointed to my opponent and I said, give him two of them. So, <laughs> this was a different bar though. My story about the two Buddhists. I went into a bar. I gave a talk. They hadn't realized I was coming, but they were sitting there. They listened and they wanted to talk to me afterwards. So we chatted for a while. I found out what they believed. And I asked them, And I, I hadn't tried to make an argument for the point. I just said, if you were persuaded that Jesus of Nazareth had died and been buried and rose again, would it make a difference to you? And they said, no, not really. Wow. I just saved myself a lot of time by not presenting a complex, multi-layered argument for the resurrection of Jesus, because that's not where they were. The question before the question was, why should I change my worldview? I'm comfortable with my Buddhist principles. I don't see any, I grew up as a Catholic, I don't see anything you Christians have to offer that I don't have, and, and I just think this is a better way. They're not going to listen to the argument that it's true. My friend Frank Turek likes to ask skeptics sometimes, if Christianity were true, if you could be persuaded of that to your satisfaction, would you believe it? Do you even wish that it were true? And often, the answer is no. No, I don't wish that it were true, and if it were true, I'd be angry at God, and I'd be angry at you because you're a Christian. Well, what do you say then except, uh, can I buy you a beer uh, or a non-alcoholic beer? Sorry, I, I don't know how that works, but <laughs> not being a beer drinker myself, true confessions. But, you know, what else do you say to somebody like that? At that point, you need to move to a totally different kind of conversation. And if you're not ready for that, if you're not ready to realize that, to recognize that when it comes up, then you are not ready for contemporary apologetic engagement. I love all of the give and the take of the arguments about the historical reliability of the Gospels. I'm going to be talking about that stuff in breakout sessions for the next three days. I love that stuff. I love arguing about miracles. I'll be up here tonight talking about the arguments regarding miracles and how to think about miracles. I, that's bread and butter to me. But before we can even get to do that, we have to earn a hearing. And one of the ways to earn that hearing is to look at people who had to do it in their own time and learn lessons from them. Make good men wish it were true and then show them that it is. Actually, Tom, can I just interrupt and tell another story? No, sure. I'm yeah. incorrigible like this. We're still friends. I teach many classes, and one class I love to teach is an honors history and philosophy of science sequence. I've got two semesters worth of this. We go from pre-Socratic atomists all the way through chaos theory. So we catch Einstein on the way. Oh, wow, that's a fun course to teach. And I had one year for the first half of that a honor student, older guy, about 40, non-traditional student. He's the first person for whom I ever wrote a letter of recommendation that began with the line, this man is a genius. He could read a novel aloud to you, and as he would flip the page, he'd start laughing, and there's nothing funny there. And it, he'd just start chuckling as he's reading. And you'd be like, what is it? Well, it's that he, in the quarter of a second it took him to flip the page, he's read both pages, and down here the author's going to make a joke about what happens up there. He really wanted to be able to talk to somebody without having to put the intellectual brakes on. That was hard for him. But he also made it very plain to me right at the outset of the semester he was not interested in religion. 
didn't want to talk about it. But he was lonely, and he needed the intellectual companionship, so we would meet every week, sometimes a couple times a week, and we would talk. We would talk about graduate-level graph theory, and we would talk about novels that he had read, and we would talk about details of ancient history, and he had an encyclopedic mind just stocked with absolutely everything. One day he said to me, I don't have any novels I'm reading right now. I finished the last one I was reading, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, you, what did that take you, five and a half minutes? And uh, he said, do you have any recommendations? So I recommended a novel to him. I recommended that he read the novel Gilead by Marilyn Robinson. I don't know how many of you know of it. It's a Pulitzer Prize winning novel. The main character is a Christian minister. And just as David Putnam did in Chariots of Fire, Robinson treats the main character's Christianity with integrity. I'm not saying he's a model of all the things I would believe, but she, he takes his faith seriously and so does she. And he's writing, the whole novel is written as a series of letters by this old minister who his first wife has died, he's remarried a much younger woman, and to their surprise, she's born a son, and his son is just too young to understand all the things his father wants to tell him. So here's this man near the end of his life writing a series of very loving letters to his son. So I said to my student, I, you know, why don't you try this one? He said, okay. And the next week I saw him and I said, so how'd you like the novel? I figured he was done. And suddenly, he got very emotional. He said, I, I had to stop reading. And I said, why? And he said, there's never been anyone that good. There has never been anyone that good. I would give everything I have to have a father like that for five minutes. did I just touch? And I said, I've known some people like that. I think you should keep reading. I waited a week before I talked to him about it next, and I was a little bit more cautious. I just said, did you get any farther in that novel? He nodded. And then he said, but I had to stop reading again. I just waited this time. And he said to me, he was at a point in the novel where a much younger man wanders through the story and becomes kind of close with the minister's wife. And he says, I'm just afraid that the author is going to hurt the main character. And I'm not going to be able to bear it. So I said, do you trust me? He thought about it for a moment, and then he nodded, and I said, you're in good hands. I think you should keep reading. The next time I saw him, he came up to me, and he said to me, I'd like to talk to you about Christianity. And I said, I would love to have that conversation, but you made it very plain right at the beginning of the semester that you were not asking, and I have respected that. He said, I know. I think I'm asking now. We've got to develop a new moral apologetic. That's, that's the sum of it. Yeah. I think we're ready for... Yeah, it's because lunch is coming, and we want to do Q&A without pushing lunch down, or all of you will hate us forever. So we want to persuade you that we are good, so... Great! <laughs> yeah. Bob, are we set for Q&A? Do we have the ability to take any, anybody yeah. left or right? We will judge you, Rick, depending well, on which microphone you walk up to. While you're coming to the mics, one question that's being asked of me frequently is about the boot, and the answer, for those who have seen me wearing uh, yeah. it a lot, the answer is... I, I had a foot problem years ago, and I lost the other shoe. Um, no. The real answer is I've just got a chronic kind of a structural flaw in both feet. And if you've seen me wearing a boot here two or three or four times before, I don't know when it's going to end, and that's the answer to that hard question. And that's just life for me. Yeah. Any other questions germane to the talk? You better ask, because otherwise I'm just going to start naming old books that you should go read.
and that gets really long. That's a long list. I know there's a lot of people out there who misinterpret what is said about the Christian faith, but what about those who are leaders in the Christian faith who actually teach some of this stuff that is off base? What do we do about that? Because that's actually hurting our cause. Amen. Um, th this is tough because you don't want to look divisive within the church. On the other hand, the divisiveness comes from them, perhaps. Um, they went out from us because they were not of us. And we have got to, I think, be honest. We've got to be, and we've got to speak with integrity, which includes love, but includes speaking truth to power, which in some cases is speaking truth to the power of the government, perhaps, the power of the courts, but it may be speaking truth to the power of people who are misrepresenting us from positions of influence. People who misrepresent us or people who claim to speak in the name of Christianity and then whose lives and actions don't live up to that. Old authors from this little book by Brown, which you can get at project360.org, just uh, spell out the word 360. Um, here's Justin Martyr from his first apology. Now, whoever are not found to live as Christ taught them, let it be publicly known that they are not Christians, although they profess with their tongue the doctrines of Christ. For he declares that not they only who profess, but they who do his works shall be saved. For this he said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And we even entreat that those who do not live according to their teachings, but are merely called Christians, may be punished by you. If they're doing evil and cloaking it with the name of Christianity, we have nothing to say for them. They are not of us. Yeah, he says publicly known. Now, Galatians 6.1 says, if a man is caught in any trespass, restore such a one, yet looking to yourselves, lest you also be tempted. It says, let him who is spiritual restore such a one. Look into yourselves, lest you be tempted. Done with humility and with care, but yes, done. Uh, you spoke a lot about people that would say that slavery you know, was condoned in the Bible. Could you give me a good defense for some of the New Testament um, passages that reference slavery? Off the top of your head? I would say very first place to go is the book of Philemon and actually read it with your eyes open. Okay? Here's Paul saying, I'm sending Onesimus back to you. And I could tell you, because I'm an apostle, I could just tell you to do the right thing, but I'm going to count on your doing it anyway. Man, that Paul, what a guy. He knows how to lean on somebody, doesn't he? Look at, look at what he's saying. Look at, look at the history of Christianity. Look at every place where Christianity has flourished. Slavery has been uprooted. Did some people appeal to some Old Testament texts in order to support chattel slavery. Yes, they did. Such people pervert the teachings of Christ. They pervert the teachings of Scripture. I would say Philemon's your first go-to place, but also this. Also remember what Paul says in Galatians. You know, there's a morning prayer that the rabbis used to pray. We have this in the rabbinical writings, in which a man would thank the maker of the universe that he was not a Gentile. He would thank the maker of the universe. I thank you, O maker of the universe, that I am not a woman. I thank you, O maker of the universe, that I am not a slave. And along comes Paul. And what does he say in Galatians 3? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither male nor female. There is neither slave nor free. We are one. Do you think Rabbi Paul didn't know that prayer? He's taking it 
and he's turning it on its head. I think it's possible for people to read the Scriptures in a casual way and not realize just how quietly, thoroughly subversive of such institutions the Scriptures are. And so that is where I would begin. Tom? Yeah, there's also in Ephesians where he speaks to how slaves should be treated by their masters. There's also, and I cannot find it, somebody might know it, it's in, I think, 1 Timothy or 2nd, I think it's in 1 Timothy, where is a very clear, very clear prohibition against um, chattel slavery in the form of kidnapping for slavery, which is what chattel slavery yes, was. Yes. Um, but Jesus didn't say, free all the slaves, if he had, he would have been a different kind of messiah. He would have been a, been a political messiah. He would have uh, really, I think, diluted his message. And probably in the long run, I'm actually, I, I, can, I can't prove this, but in the long run, I am sure there would have been a lot fewer slaves freed. Because by produ introducing the kind of revolution he did introduce by changing people's hearts, that resulted in slavery just as, as Rodney Stark puts it, it just kind of just went away wherever Christianity is, is, as Tim said. So that's, that's the general tenor of the answer. Um, if you want to talk more, we're going to be hanging out with you all at lunch and at dinner, so come find us or we'll come find you and, yeah. and ask more. We've got a few more people. I want to hit a few more of these, so. Hello. Hey. Um, so talked about the idea of us being able to prove that we're good and whatnot. So how do we do that, A, without virtue signaling, and B, when unrealistic demands are made against us that in order not to be racist or sexist, we have to like things like yeah. The Last Jedi? What was A again? I missed that. How do you do it without virtue signaling? Oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. clearly there is a problem with saying, look at me, I'm good, right? That, how, why doesn't that fly? Yeah, obviously. Um, you start with action. You start letting people know that you're there for them, that you're willing to go out of your way for them. And for a while, it doesn't feel like anybody notices, and you just keep doing it because it's the right thing to do. And then at 12.30 in the night, you get the phone call from the atheist lesbian who says, my landlord just came drunk into my apartment and was screaming at me, I have to get out, can you please come over and help me find a hotel? And then you go over and you do it. And that's when you know that they were looking after all, that they realized that you are a safe person and a person who would not hesitate for a moment to go over and help. But it all starts with action. Isn't that a good thing? I mean, if I said it starts with talk, what kind of a wreck would that be? Yeah. So it has to start with your acting with integrity, with your not promising things that you're not going to deliver. Um, and when you uh, and, and that's not, I'm not talking Christian-y things, normal things, normal kind of help. Don't tell somebody you're going to bring them a meal and then not bring them a meal. Don't even lead them into thinking you're the kind of person who would do that and then not do it. Instead, don't say anything about it until you call and you say, hey, I'd, I'd like to bring you a meal. Uh, when would be a good time? What do you guys eat? You got any restrictions, dietary? Uh, be sensitive, be thoughtful. Don't tread on people's toes because you can. If you're going to invite the Muslim student over for your Thanksgiving meal, Ask, do you eat halal? What, what can you eat? What can, you know, we, you're going to be gracious to somebody? Go all the way and do it. Gradually, slowly, with a person here and a person there, the people who need to will come to realize that. And then you may find that you don't have to say anything and that they will say for you those things, and that would be the best way of all. A long life, consistent self-sacrificial love, which is a very dangerous thing I just said in front of a group of people because I think God's going to hold me accountable to it. Uh, he would have anyway. But, but now especially. Yeah. Yeah. Darn it. Um, okay. Um, my question would be, how do you speak to somebody whose only experience um, 
with God would be a negative experience that they've had from Christians or from the church. Listen, yes. we. I, just, just start with empathy, with caring and saying, I am so sorry that happened to you. Don't, don't apologize for things that are not wrong. Because uh, some people will say it was a negative experience if they went to church and, and, and the church expected them to follow the Bible. But, um, but listen and weep and care. And um, that's probably 90%. And then so at some point you're going to get the other 10%, which is answering. Yeah, Francis Schaeffer used to say, and this is just generally good advice, that if he had an hour to spend talking to a skeptic, he'd spend... 55 minutes listening, and then maybe in the last five minutes he'd ask a question or say something, but the listening has to preponderate, and uh, just, be, just being willing to do that. I've had students who have been willing to take Christianity seriously after I've listened sometimes whole conversations doing nothing more than listening, saying, would you mind if I just took a few notes? I want to, I want to remember what you've said. I'm taking you seriously. And, and maybe nothing more. And if it doesn't seem at that point like they want to hear anything more, then don't push it. The listening is huge. I had a radio interviewer ask me once after I published a book on atheism. He said, what's the first thing you say to an atheist? I don't know. But what I said was, essentially, t uh, tell me your story. That's the first thing I'd say to an atheist. Depends on what they said first, of course. Yeah. Do we have time, Bob, <laughs> for one or two more? Can we, or are, are we pushing that lunch thing? All right, go. <laughs> Do you have any other recommendations for novels that show the beauty of the gospel, like Gilead? Oh, novels like Gilead that show the beauty of the gospel? Yeah. Um, I. I would recommend Elizabeth Googe's novel, The Dean's Watch. She's a lesser known British author, uh, early 20th century, um, really a, a very beautiful thing. Also, uh, Agatha Christie wrote a novel under a pseudonym so that people wouldn't think it was a mystery novel. It's called The Burden, and the pseudonym is Mary Westmacott. And it's, it's quite an interesting. One of the main characters used to be an evangelist, and then as he puts it, God fired me. And uh, it's, it, it explores some deep themes, and it does it in, I think, a very interesting way. Um, there are actually, I mean, there, there's a lot that I could say, much of Dostoevsky, but it's long stuff, right? How do you get somebody to read through the Brothers Karamazov? But if you're dealing with somebody who can do it, don't hesitate to go there. Uh, some of Solzhenitsyn's work. Uh, Tom, you probably got to... Les Mis. Yeah, as Les Mis. And as a play. Um, if you get a chance to, to see the musical. It is the most Christian piece of art that I have ever observed in, in our generation. Yeah. What are some very uh, practical ways the church, not just the individual, but the church as a whole, can uh, help build back these relationships that are really strained, especially like, for example, with the LGBT community? Start by talking to some people who've been there and come out of it. Find them, hunt them down. If you need to track down Rosaria Butterfield, do it. And say, Could you help us, tell us what to do. There are things in the, those communities that they do better than most Christians do. Hospitality is something they've got down really well in the LGBT community that we need to learn more about how to do. Um, so talk to people who've been there and who've who love Christianity and find out well, what kept you away, what finally brought you, how can we do better? Find those things out. Those of you who are, are stuck standing at the mics, just come up and talk to us right afterward. We're just, we're yeah. not going anywhere. One more further point on LGBT. Um, if you want a calm conversation, a rational, sane conversation, study first. If you know what you're talking about and you're comfortable with your position, both from a biblical and a natural law or common sense perspective, common experience perspective. If you're not like worried, if you're not anxious, you can have a better conversation even while you disagree. But 
boy, there's a lot to be said for knowing what you're, where you stand and then having a loving conversation from that perspective. 